I often wonder about the nature of reality, about our relationship to the creative force that forged the particles of our stars and intertwined them with the molecules of our bodies. Who are we? And where are we actually sitting within the architecture of our universe? Are we alone? Or is the answer simply stranger than we can think? My name is Jeremy Corbell. I seek to weaponize your curiosity. And if you're ready to suspend your own prejudice, welcome to the world of extraordinary beliefs. I wanted to bring every single mode and zoom that the FLIR is capable of back to the carrier so we could analyze this thing because to go from whatever its airspeed was to something that's just impossible by any physical standard, instantaneous acceleration that would crush a pilot and just from a structural engineering standpoint, it would just rip wings right off the aircraft. It's something I, I can't describe from a physics-based perspective. That's the voice of Lieutenant Commander Chad Underwood, a badass Navy weapon systems officer with VFA-41 in the FA-18 Super Hornet with the legendary Black Aces. Underwood's testimony represents the first time in history a military Wizzo filmed the UFO during active operations where the encounter footage has been confirmed directly by the United States government as being actual. Actual film footage of an advanced aerospace vehicle of unknown origin. A real UFO. Underwood's account and footage also represents independent and corroborating evidence to accompany the experience of Commander David Fravor the man who engaged a tic-tac-shaped UFO with his fighter jet for our military. The unidentified craft they observed and engaged that day was able to outpace and outmaneuver our nation's most advanced warplanes. It did, in fact, zoom off to the left of Underwood's wing, and it broke the lock of his AT FLIR targeting pod, which is not an easy thing to do. It had no typical aeronautics or aerospace propulsion signatures, no tail, no wings, no exhaust plumes, and it was also able to offensively jam our pilot's radar and weapon systems. Under the circumstances, this is considered an act of war by the United States Department of Defense, and typically, there are consequences. However, nothing about Lieutenant Commander Underwood's and Commander Fravor's experiences were typical. What you're about to hear is important. It has historic value. It's evidence of advanced and unknown aerospace vehicles operating in our restricted airspace with impunity, displaying instantaneous acceleration and impossible speeds. Technology we simply do not have. If this is not a national security issue, I don't know what is. Certainly, this is an existential conundrum, and it's time we face the UFO reality head on, whatever it might represent. But let's hear what Lieutenant Commander Underwood has to say about it. After all, he is the person that filmed it. What's your name and what was your title and role in 2004? My name is Chad Underwood. My call sign is Nuts. I was on USS Nimitz in November of 2004. I was with the Black Aces of BFA 41 serving under Dave Sex Fravor. I filmed the Tic Tac Clear video. We're talking peacetime operations off the coast of San Diego. We're not talking in the Black Sea against Russia or the Baltics or anything like that. Dave's just landed from his flight. He's taking his gear off. I'm putting my gear on. He's like, hey, man, we saw something out there, and I want you to go and investigate it. Put your tapes on. Dave did not have a flare pod on his aircraft, and he knew that I did. We were going to go operate in the same piece of sky that they just came from. So go launch on the mission. Go out to do some intercepts, hone our skills, 
And then when we got up there, you kind of do your checks, making sure that all your squawks are all accurate and you're going to report to this cap location and this is where you're going to conduct your portion of the exercise. And that's when we got a vector from the Princeton saying, hey, investigate target on this bearing and range. And lo and behold, you get a blip on the radar. Once I got the FLIR lock, that's not an aircraft. The debunkers, one of the things they're saying is that the Tic Tac, it's just another plane. Aircraft have very, very specific infrared signatures that show up on your FLIR pod. You cannot mistake it. Whether it's a 737, another F-18, or an enemy aircraft, there are key features that on that infrared pod that identify it as an aircraft. At this point, I'm ruling out what I, what I know it's not. I'm looking at it with essentially a $6 million camera, an infrared camera. This is not conventional aircraft of a U.S. military. It's not a civilian airliner. It's certainly not a bird. It's not a helicopter. I've pretty much seen anything that's either on the surface or in the air. I've seen enough to know what things are and what things aren't. I'm close enough to the object that I should be able to even tell whether it's a military aircraft versus a civilian aircraft. I should be able to tell that by the features that you would normally and typically see. There should be no doubt any aircraft of any type, whether we're talking a helicopter or a fixed wing aircraft of a fighter or commercial, you should be able to see a tail. You should be able to see wings. You should see the exhaust plume. Those should be very, very obvious on a FLIR pod. The infrared portion of that is just looking for heat contrast between a target and its background. I was not seeing any of those features. The biggest giveaway is the exhaust plume, because that's just nothing but heat. And so once I saw it on the FLIR pod, I was like, okay, this is not a conventional aircraft. At the range you were from the Tic Tac UFO vehicle, you should have been able to see rotors, tail, wings, plumes, and exhaust. Right. You're not seeing that. None of it. The Tic Tac UFO had none of that. That's correct. Wow. It's featureless. It's just this elongated thing. There's no distinguishing feature that says, this is an aircraft. I have no idea what this thing is. This Tic Tac UFO, why is this different than anything you've seen before? When you take a radar lock on something, I'm going to see your airspeed. I'm going to see your altitude. I'm going to see your heading. I'm going to see your aspect. I'm going to see all of that on my radar. Every bit of information that that radar can possibly give me, I'm going to know. And I'm going to have all that situational awareness right there in front of me. And it's happening real time. There's no latency. There's no delays in scanning or anything like that. What was different about this was as soon as I took that lock, the track started doing all sorts of just little things that are not normal. The heading was erratic. It should be able to tell me your airspeed and also your Mach number. So it should say like 0.8 Mach, for example. So, you know, 80% the speed of sound. It should say that. It was jumping all over the place. It was like 0 0.8, 0 0.4, 0 0.2, 0 0.1, 0.9. And it's just, it's just like my radar can't hack it. And in all instances, it should be able to hack that. And then I was also receiving what they're called strobe lines. And they just basically look like lines on your radar that are indications that you're being jammed. So that Tic Tac jamming us would be considered an act of war. It's not that I'm going to go shoot down an aircraft because it's jamming me, but I'm going to report back to my boss that it's jamming me and I've got proof of it and that'll make its way to the Pentagon. It has consequences. It was offensively jamming us just outside international waters in peacetime operations. It's an act of war and we're going to go out there and make you pay for that. It does have consequences. However, that plays itself out. And that's where I was like, okay, this is, this is something different. I was like, okay, I've got a FLIR lock. FLIR is just giving me optical and infrared information. They can't optically jam me. So I went to the FLIR pod, and that's where I started focusing 90% of my effort. Mainly, I'm just trying to get all this shit on tape, bring back as much video evidence to our intelligence folks. Say, well, why didn't you go to narrow field of view? Why didn't you go to super narrow? Why didn't you go to e why did you go to tv mode versus like i didn't want any of those questions to be asked to me when i went to the intelligence center so i started zooming in that's where you see on the clear video like changing polarity all of a sudden you see the whole screen go like all white and then the, the tic tac is black i reverse the polarity so the background is black and tic tac is white i'm zooming in i'm that's why i'm going through all those different modes 
is to just try to bring back as much video evidence to our intelligence folks. I wanted to bring every single mode and zoom that the FLIR is capable of back to the carrier so we could analyze this thing because I'm not going to be able to solve this problem in real time. Debunkers say when you're filming, it only appears to move left, but in fact, it was you banking your craft. Aircraft was straight and level at that point. If you look at the FLIR pod, there's no change in heading or altitude or airspeed. Our aircraft was straight and level the entire time. None of those things change. I'm not maneuvering the aircraft in a manner in which, in those circumstances, would cause the FLIR to drop track. That did not happen. I was at a very benign heading, airspeed, altitude, and bank angle that the FLIR will not drop that track. When the aircraft zips off to the left and you see the two bars that were on either side of the Tic Tac, you'll see they'll try to like reacquire. When you see those two bars kind of widen, that means it's trying to like open up its eyes wider to find you again and then get back to an auto track. By that point, the Tic Tac is already way off the left side of my scope and basically it's gone. They also say that there was a two-time zoom right at that moment when the Tic Tac UFO appears mm -hmm. to shoot off to the left. So it's mm -hmm. an exaggerated speed. Did you lose track on it? No. What it, makes it go left? It, when you go from one to two X or something like that, one to two times zoom, you're not dropping the track and trying to reacquire it in two times zoom. At no point will it drop track. Think about it like you're looking at your iPhone from 12 inches away and all of a sudden you just put it in six inches away from your face. That's the only difference. You're not dropping that lock. All you're doing is basically just trying to get a closer look at it. I go through all the zoom features and I'm not dropping its track. Uh, the, the track is there the entire time. It broke my lock by zooming off to the left. So you're telling me the Tic Tac UFO shot off to the left. The targeting pod lost track because mm -hmm. it moved. Yeah, the FLIR pod, is, it's a weapon system. So it's made and designed and engineered for aggressive maneuvering and still be able to maintain stability on whatever it is that you've got acquired. The Tic Tac shot off to your left. Yeah, yeah, with instantaneous acceleration. If it were just to kind of veer off to the left, the FLIR would be able to track that with no problem. But it, it shot off at an instant acceleration that the FLIR just is not engineered to, to be able to hack, I guess. So what kind of aggressive forces does it take to drop track? Anything greater than about 40 to 45 degrees angle of bank and greater than 3 to 5 Gs rate of heading change, you know, we're straight and level. The Tic Tac UFO shot off to the left from a standstill with instantaneous motion. Explain that. I can't. When I say from a standstill, the Tic Tac, it's not like it's sitting there in a hover. It's in motion. It's moving in some sort of velocity and a vector to go from whatever its airspeed was at the time to something that's just impossible by any physical standard is something I, I can't describe from a physics-based perspective. I can't do it. Things don't just instantaneously accelerate like that. And like what Dave said, even an SR-71, it's a Mach 3 plus aircraft, doesn't just go from 250 knots to 2,000 knots instantaneously. That's not how normal propulsion systems that we know, conventional propulsion systems that we know are capable of. That's the part that blew me away, both in real time and after the fact. I was like, what just happened? It just, bam, just went away. You know, it just zipped off. Instantaneous acceleration that would crush a pilot. And just from a structural engineering standpoint, it would just rip wings right off the aircraft if it indeed had wings. What I clearly hear you saying is the object is not an illusion of a two-time zoom. I didn't manually pull off the track of the weapon systems that the Tic Tac UFO shot to your left with instantaneous inertia, instantaneous acceleration. Yes. That's profound. Yeah. That's the part that I took away from the whole experience was that moment where it just zipped off. That was my kind of weirded out moment. I was trying to find it and reacquire and asking the prince, I'm like, hey, where'd that thing go? And there was like, you know, negative radar contact, which means their radar scope's clean as well. My radar's got a certain scan volume and my FLIR for that matter. Once it flies out of that field of view, let's just call it plus or minus 70 degrees of my nose, 
that I, I'm going to have to maneuver the aircraft towards the direction that that thing went and try to reacquire it on my sensors because I don't have 360 degrees worth of radar scan in my aircraft. The Princeton does. It can look in all directions and figure out where things are, and it can give me a vector, say, hey, just back behind you. So that way I could turn around and get all my sensors back in that sector. I saw it shoot off to the left, and then I started to maneuver the aircraft to the left and try to reacquire it. There was nothing there. It wasn't for a lack of effort. I was trying to reacquire the thing, but that was, that was it. You were the pilot, and you were telling me that the debunkers are wrong. Yes. The debunkers, in my experience with it, they're going to challenge every bit of evidence that you bring back. But by that point, I've had a whole bunch of combat missions. I've seen a lot of shit. I've been shot at. I've dropped bombs, shot missiles at enemy targets. I know what shit looks like in the air and on the ground at daytime, nighttime. This was happening in the mid-afternoon on a very benign, peacetime kind of day. There's no question that if it was something conventional, either from a commercial standpoint or a military standpoint, that should have been a piece of cake. And the fact that it wasn't, and it was just something I've never seen before and exhibited no conventional flight characteristics that physics allows us at this point, I've ruled out everything that it could possibly be. And I'm left with, I have no fucking idea what this thing was. It wasn't any sort of special project because because I got it on video, if it was some sort of black project, black meaning some sort of unacknowledged U.S. program, I would have been debriefed on it because I brought back video and I could have gone public with it and I could have gotten myself and the military in a big old pickle. If you start to see black projects, and it's happened to me before where I've seen something that I shouldn't have and I've gotten debriefed saying, hey, this is a secret, unacknowledged program that you witnessed or you got video of. You talk to a person from some three-letter agency, you sign an NDA, and you'll never speak of this again. That never happened. And if it was some sort of black U.S. project, I would have been told not what it is or what it's capable of or what even the project name is. You have stumbled upon things that are black project, and there's a <laughs> protocol for that. They, they certainly yeah. won't be re releasing these videos via the Pentagon if this Yeah, was. exactly. That shines a light on how this was handled or not handled. Appreciate the perspective. I think we're kind of in the right place at the right time for this stuff to be talked about, especially confirmed and, you know, having Pentagon release assessments that these things are valid and the pilots that are out there, whether it be commercial pilots or military pilots, especially when we have the technology to bring back video and eyewitness accounts from guys that are flying fighters whose brains work on a very finely tuned level. When we bring this back to the carrier as a story, it's worth listening to. They've been confirmed as unidentified or whatever the new term is, UAPs or whatever. It's not like we go out there looking for this shit, but when you find something, it gets your attention. Yeah, you stumble yeah. across it. People always ask, like, what do you think it was? I'm like, I, dude, I have no idea. I was at the right place at the right time. I got the video. I brought it back. And here we are. Thank you so much. An honor. And I admire the work that you do and the stories that you're telling. I think it's the right time for it. The platforms that you've been fortunate enough to tell these stories on and with the individuals is you can't get any higher than that. People have been real kind to share their information with me. It's just starting. There's a lot going on. We're going to be I, learning a lot real soon. I'll tell you that.